I'm pleased to introduce Alicia Gross, who's our uh, guest speaker today. Uh, she's, of course, disappointed that she's not out here skiing and doing, doing all the winter things here, although she was telling us they did have a snow day yesterday in Alabama. They got a whole inch of snow and her kids got the day off. So, that, uh, so but we have a bit more snow here finally uh, this winter. So Alicia is from New England and she did her uh, ba bachelor's degree in biochemistry at University of New Hampshire and a PhD in biochemistry at Brandeis University. She did a postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Ted Wenzel at Baylor College and then has been at Alabama since about 2006, I think, and has worked, at, worked her way up through the ranks where she's currently an associate professor with tenure at the, at the University of Alabama Department of Neuro, Neurobiology. And I also see she's an assistant dean for faculty onboarding. And I don't know what that really means, but I guess I'll learn about that when I talk, talk with her later today. I'm like the welcoming committee. Okay, all right. <laughs> So um, the reason, obviously, as we're going to learn, Alicia does some really great work on neurobiology of the retina. Our connection goes back almost 10 years when we were, Alicia and I were on the program committee for ARVO uh, in the biochemistry section. So we worked together an awful lot uh, for about three or four weeks every year, right around uh, ruining our Christmas breaks, doing uh, figuring out and making a good program, reading through hundreds of abstracts and trying to form formulate a good ARVO. So uh, with that, I will let Alicia take, take the lead and give us a great talk this morning. And she will also be giving a noon, more basic science seminar at that time. So Thank go you. ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for um, inviting me to come again. I'm sorry I can't be there in person more than you can imagine, because I would love to be there um, and see some good friends that I've, I've known for throughout the years. Um, I'm going to try to, um, I have this on two screens, so if I look over here, it's because I'm trying to look at your faces. So if, um, if you have any questions, please inter interrupt me. I have no problem with just straight up um, pushing the space bar and at shouting out a question, so I would really welcome that. Um, so my lab is interested in the molecular mechanisms of retinal degenerations and what happens on a protein level when, um, when rod cells are formed and when rod cells degenerate, what happens on, on um, subcellularly. And we have, we have several models of um, different, different um, retinal degenerations in the lab. We work with transgenic tadpoles. These guys have baseball bat sized photoreceptors. You can express whatever you want transgenically um, under the rod opsin promoter, really easy. And in two weeks, we have beautiful retina you can see here. Um, I'm not going to talk about tadpoles in this talk. I will in the next seminar. Um, all the work that I'm going to be talking about is um, on the backs of these guys. These are, these are knock-in and knock-out mice that we have um, made and generated um, for these projects. So in case you decide to fall asleep in this talk, uh-oh, how do I, I'm trying to advance. Okay. If you do fall asleep in the middle of this talk, these are the take-home points. So I'm hopefully going to be convincing you that the protein BBS5 is required for cone cell health and retinal function in cones, but not so much in rods. And MKS6 is critical for, for rod cell health and homeostasis, but not so much in cones. Okay. So let's take a little step back. Um, and in this crowd, it's kind of Hold on, it's kind of silly to talk about, um, <laughs> I can't advance my slides. How did I do it last time? All right, I'll do it the old fashioned way, just click on that tile. Okay, um, it seems silly to talk about uh, where photoreceptors are, but humor me for just a minute. So this is my cartoon version of a sagittal section taken of a, a vertebrate eye, and you can see that light comes in through the cornea and gets focused onto the lens, where it further gets focused to the back of the, of the um, eye cup here on the neural retina. In the outer retina sit these rods and cone photoreceptors. And so I, these are the, the two cell types that my lab is mainly interested in. If you were to turn those over, you can see that they, um, here in this scanning electron micrograph image of a mouse 
uh, retina um, that I took at Woods Hole some years back, um, you can see how gorgeous the retina is, right? So we have all of the outer segments of the photoreceptors lined up. These are the, this is the portion of the cells that, that capture a, a photon of light. Here's the inner segment region, the outer nuclear layer, the synapse, and then the inner retina is down below there. And this is a chunk of retina that is, that is split. So you can see down in the, the um, kind of crack down in there to see the, the, um, the synapses. But here you can see, this is the top of, of a chunk of retina. You can see all of those photoreceptor cells there, the outer segments look like shag carpeting. And these big RPE cells sit right on top of it. About 50 of those sit on top of outer segments. And they provide, a, they, they have a multitude of jobs. So if you look at these, these um, photoreceptor cells in this cartoon format here, we know that photoreceptor cells are neurons. They have a synaptic ending. Um, they've got a nuclear region here, all these, all these nuclei there, and then an inner segment region, which contain, which houses all of the uh, cell machinery necessary for um, its function, right? We've got mitochondria and Golgi and microtubules all in the inner segment here, and that inner segment is separated from the outer segment via a connecting cilium or a transition zone. And so this is the primary cilium. It's highly modified in photoreceptors, they're about, in rod cells, there are about 2,000 membranous discs that are, that are ve um, vesicles smooshed down like pancakes, but 2,000 of those are stacked on top of each other. And that's where all the phototransduction components reside. So these are post-mitotic cells, but by no means are they, are they static. These are very, very dynamic cells. We know that um, RPE cells um, have, Phagocytose, the distal tips, they come in and they, they plop off about 10% of the outer, outer segment discs every single day. And that causes a turnover. About a million molecules of rhodopsin gets expressed in the inner segment, transported through this, this connecting cilium region here, um, and then packaged into discs. And if that doesn't happen with high fidelity and astute precision, then the cell undergoes apoptosis and takes out all photoreceptors with it, okay? So my lab is interested in the molecular mechanisms of that process and of the proteins that help sort um, who goes where, okay? So if we were to take a look, um, a very common mutation in rhodopsin, one of my favorite proteins, um, we know that uh, rhodopsin is expressed highly in the outer segment. So this is a cryosection taken from a mouse and stained in red for rhodopsin. You can see it's really highly enriched in the outer segments, very little in the inner segments, and very, very little, if any, down in the synapse and in the nuclear layer. But look what happens if you mutate just the last five amino acids of rhodopsin. Here you can see um, massive protein mislocalization. Q344 ter rhodopsin is found in human patients with retinitis pigmentosa. Um, not only does this protein uh, mislocalized, this mutant rhodopsin, but it takes the wild type along with it, okay? And so, so part of my lab is interested in, in this process, the molecular uh, process of, of determining how rhodopsin gets to the outer segment. I'll talk to you a little bit about that in, in the next seminar. Um, but I'm also interested in the proteins that are involved in the connecting cilium region here. So let's take a look, a cartoon look at, of, of that region. Um, you've heard some excellent, um, I'm sure you've, you've um, followed Wolfgang's work and his, he's done some excellent work on Rab8 and Rab11 in mice. Um, and in the, that's in the Trans-Golgi network. And we're not gonna talk about Rab11 today, although my lab has played with that as well. Um, what I am gonna focus on though, is the BBSome and the transition zone. And so the, these are, this is a longstanding collaboration that I've had with I'm Dr. Brad Yoder, who um, is here at UAB. He's um, he's at the chair. He's the chair of cell biology right across the street over here. Um, he is interested in um, the transition zones of primary cilia, in particular in the kidney, and and so we we um, fit well together. Um, he, he has helped. Um, let's see. He and I have a series of mice that we have made um, mutating or, or knocking out these proteins to help figure out what their roles are. And I'm gonna focus right now on BBS5. 
So BBS5 is found associated with uh, Barty Beetle syndrome. So Barty Beetle syndrome is a, is a ciliopathy. It's very rare. It's only about one in about 100,000 worldwide. Um, it varies from population to population. It also varies within family. The, the severity of the disease varies within families. Um, it is, um, here's a patient with Barty Beetle syndrome. You can see this, this young man is obese, he's polydactyly. Um, he has hypergonadism, um, polycystic kidneys, learning disabilities, hearing loss. Um, but important for, for my research and for this talk, retinal dystrophy. So with Brad, we made a, a knockout mouse, um, a congenital knockout, and we have a flux knockout that I'm not going to be talking about today, um, where if you were to take, take tissues from this animal, you can see that in a wild type retina, um, a Western blot here showing really intense staining of BBS5 in the retina and in BBS5 in the kidney, but it's lacking in the, the knockouts in both BBS5 um, retina and kidney knockouts. You can also see that it's that it's recapitulating some of the phenotypes seen in, in, in humans, right? This this mouse is obviously obese. These are age matched litter ma um, um, age matched animals. Okay, so we wondered, um, is there any phenotype in the eye? And one thing we can do quite easily is just histology to look to see if the retina is degenerating. And this was done by a former graduate student in my lab, uh, Katie Bale. She's now doing a postdoc with Michelle Pardue. Um, at, at the VA and um, at Emory um, right now. So she just left my lab just a little bit ago, but this is her dissertation work. Um, so together with Katie and Brad, we looked at the um, a two month old animal and a nine month old animal. And so you can, we can judge the overall health of a retina by simply counting the number of nuclei in the outer nuclear layer. They do stack on top of each other. And so you can just count up and see, see that in wild type animals here in red, um, you can see a nice healthy retina. Um, as, you, as you pan across the, the, the retina itself, there's the optic nerve right here. And, in, and we see a slight decrease in the numbers of nuclei in the two month old BBS5 knockout. Now these animals are hard to eat. They're really hard, they're, they're difficult to raise, um, but you can see that the retina is slightly getting thinner, although it's not statistically significant at this, at this age. But look what happens in the nine month old animal. We definitely see uh, retinal degeneration. We see the number of nuclei markedly decreased, statistically significantly decreased in the nine month old animals. We know that um, the outer segment lengths are getting smaller so we can stain the retina with wheat germagglutinin which stains the sheaths of photoreceptors. We can then measure the outer segments and we see that the outer segments are getting smaller. So we know in cells, when a cell is dying or trying to save itself, one of the first things it does is retract its cilium. There's no, there's no need to have a, a, a cilium sensing the environment. If it's dying, it needs to save itself. So it, it takes that, that cilium back in, retracts it, and then and tries, to save, tries to save itself. Um, here we can also see that um, we can look for cell death by, by staining with by doing tunnel staining on these on these retinas. We do see some tunnel staining in the um, two month animals, but we see markedly increased um, cell death as shown here in red, but with the tunnel staining. So in the this is a very slow degeneration, right? This isn't this isn't a rapid degeneration. We're not talking about an RD1 mutation where the retina is dead and, 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 and degenerated in just a couple of weeks. This is slow, but it is degenerating. And so that tells us that BBS5 is critical for at least the overall health of the retina, right, of the photoreceptor cell layer. So we know um, that proteins translocate across that, that cilium um, in different light levels. So if you take an animal and dark adapt it for some time, 30 minutes, an hour, um, in complete darkness, we know that Typically, rhodopsin is going to be in the outer segments, right? It's a, it, rhodopsin is a, is a transmembrane protein. It lives in those discs. It's not going to move. Um, transducin is in the outer segments as well. It's, it's right up, kissing up next to the, the disc membranes, ready and rating. It's poised for a photon of light to come through and activate a rhodopsin so it can, it can activate phototransduction. In contrast, arrestin is down in the inner segment region. 
And that's because we think that's because transducin and arrestin are about one to one molar ratio. They're really concentrated and there's not a lot of space in outer segments. So you really want arrestin out of the way um, in the dark. Let's see. Um, and, but when you light adapt the animal, you see this massive translocation of of, pro, of these proteins. Um, arrestin actually doesn't get out of the cell. This was just an aberrant arrestin over there. But we see arrestin trafficked up to the outer segments and transducin down in the inner segments. And so we wondered if this protein movement in the light and in the dark, it, it holds true in the absence of BBS5, okay? Um, so we, we looked at this in the, in the BBS5 knockout animals. And these are the two month old animals that we have uh, dark adapted. Rhodopsin is where it's supposed to be, right? We see a little bit of rhodopsinus localization, not so much. We see just a little rhodopsinus localization. Um, transducin is where it's supposed to be in the outer segments. And arrestin is where it's supposed to be in the inner segments and down by the synapse and throughout the, the cytoplasm, okay? Oh, I wish I could just use my clicker. Oh, there it is. Um, oh, hold on. No. Technology is so much fun, right? Um, in the light, rhodopsin is where it's supposed to be, and transducin is where it's supposed to be. But look what happens with arrestin. So we see arrestin mislocalization. We see arrestin down at the syn down at the synapse through the new um, outer nuclear layer. We see some in the inner segments. We don't know, these are just static pictures. We don't know if arrestin has gone up and is leaking back down, or if it's having a heck of a time even getting up through the, that connecting cilium. And so that's, that's studies that were actually using photo switchables uh, tagged arrestins to be able to answer those questions. Well, what about function? Does this mislocalization of arrestin have anything, does it affect the function? Or does the absence of BBS5 affect the function of rod cells? And we can measure um, overall retinal health and function by using by, by electro, um, electroretinography. And so we've done that here. So this is just dark adapting an animal and scotopic lights. We've placed a contact, not a contact lens electrode, just a um, electrode onto the cornea and you can measure the overall um, signaling upon very low light levels. And here, this is um, very low light levels we've delivered onto, on, onto the eye. And in green, you can see a wild type animal has a nice A wave and a concomitant B wave that's, the, that, that's mostly due to the um, bipolar cells here. Look what happens in the BBS5 nulls in purple. The A wave is markedly decreased, okay? Um, even with, it's even more prominent in, in underscotopic but brighter light levels. You can see that the, that the amplitude of the A wave that is due to the rod photoreceptors is diminished, okay, as is the B wave. And we can analyze those data um, here. So the A wave amplitude um, in wild type is significantly higher than it, than it is in the BBS5 knockouts, as is the B wave. So we know that the rod cells are not functioning very well under scotopic conditions. We can also measure the time to peak um, to look at the overall kinetics. So we know that um, there is some BBS, there is some arrestin that is up in the connecting cilium of rod cells. Clay Smith showed that BBS5 holds on to a small little amount of, of, of arrestin in the outer segment. Um, and we think that it's, it's, it's kind of the sentinel arrestins that immediately shut off the, the signaling cascades. It's, that's why we have such fast turnover of, of the phototransduction cascade. So we wondered, um, we can look at the latencies, the, the times to peak, and they're spot on. So that the, in the absence of BBS5, we're not seeing any kinetic changes of the phototransduction cascade, okay? So what about bright lights? BBS5 nulls really have non-functioning cones, okay? So you can see this is a nice a, a, nice a and a B wave. Um, in, in wild type animals, but the pink here, the BBS5 nulls, they're, they're almost flat line. Okay, we can measure the A wave amplitudes and the B wave amplitudes here. Um, and you can see that there's, there's 
really just non-functioning cones. So what about the cone, the cone phototransduction proteins, right? There are some di differences between rods and cones in the expression of, of different um, phototransduction components. So arrestin-4 is found only in, in cones. It's not found in rods. And, and arrestin should be in the outer segment in bright lights. And you see some in the inner segments. Um, and that this is, um, we've stained with the help of Cheryl Craft's amazing antibodies, we've stained um, cone arrestin-4 here in green. You can see really nice outer segment um, expression, inner segments, we see some at the synapse, but look what happens in the BBS5 nulls. You see a marked increase at the synapse. It's really not um, um, properly localizing. Similarly, we can stain for the opsins. So the medium wavelength opsin, the green cone opsin, um, is expressed in, in mice and we can stain for it. It is really nicely in these outer segments. Look how pretty those cones are. Uh, and, but look what happens in the BBS5 nulls. We see a M cone opsin mislocalization to the inner segments and down to the synapse. Okay, so the M cone opsins are mislocalizing as are the S cone opsins. So we see here stained in purple, instead of seeing S cone opsin in the outer segments and, and some in the inner segment region, but none at the synapse. We're seeing M -cone, uh, S cone, the short wavelength blue cone um, opsins down at the synapse. So this is a marked mislocalization of this, of this um, pho uh, photoreceptor in cones. Okay, so the um, cones also express a different alpha subunit of cone transducin. Um, it so we can we can selectively look for cone al um, cone alpha um, transducin or GNAT2 um, here in the outer segments. It should be under bright light conditions. Very little in the inner segment synapse. But look, you see it littered throughout the entire cell in in cones in the BBS5 knockouts. Something else to can, to look at is the alpha subunit of the cyclic nucleotide gated channel that's only expressed in cones, and it should be up in the outer segments. We think that this green here is background, um, but you can really nicely see the outer segments. Look at the staining here; it's almost punk tape. The outer segments uh, morphologically might be looking different on an ultrastructural level, um, so we were curious about that as well. Um, there are proteins that are that are um, not trafficked the same way that the opsins are. So perforin two localizes uh, the same between between um, wild type and BBS five knockouts, and that tells us that the peripheral pathway to get to the outer segments is really unaffected in in um, BBS five knockout animals. So to take a better look at this ultrastructure of these outer segments, we ran some transmission electron microscopy, and so I'm showing you here. Um, TEM images taken from ultra thin sections of a three month old wild type uh, uh, photoreceptor layer. So you can see the outer segments look really nice. But look at these in the BBS5 nulls. We see disks that are, um, um, that are abnormal in their, um, in their juxtaposition relative to each other. So we're looking to, to uh, we are presently doing um, scanning electron microscopy, uh, serial block phase scanning EM on these animals and then some other animals that we have in our um, in our lab um, with Tom Burgoyne at University College London to be able to really see what the outer segments look like in these in these in these cones to get a better picture of a 3D rendering of it. So hopefully I've convinced you um, in this protein in the BBS5 mouse model. At two months, we see de increased cell death in the BBS5 nulls, significantly shortened outer segments, and significant cell death by nine months. So it's a slow degeneration that we see, but it is degenerating. In, let's see, we see misloc mislocalization of arrestin in both rods and cones during light adaptation, but the cone phototransduction components are mislocalized um, markedly, and they have abnormal disc, disc orientation. Hmm. I have another bullet point that's not coming up. Oh, there it is. 
um, I've shown you that the scotopic and A and B wave amplitudes are significantly decreased and there's, there's an absence of a cone response in these animals. So let's move from the BBS5 here in the BBSome up to the transition zone itself. So let's, let's take a look at MKS6. So this transition zone is thought to be a molecular sieve that allows proteins through and, and denies other proteins from entering the cilium. And um, MKS6 is one that we also worked with with Brad Yoder. Um, this is a, a devastating disease. It's, it's rare. It's, it, on average, it's about um, a prevalence of about one to 100,000 in, in the world. It depends on um, population, subpopulations in, in um, specific countries. Um, it is a recessive lethal ciliopathy. This is an embryonic lethal um, um, disease. It's a major contributor to syndromic neural tube defects. Um, it, the, these these um, humans have polycystic kidneys, polydactyly, sinus invertus. Um, these are almost every single hallmark of a ciliopathy that you could get and in including retinal dystrophy. And so we wanted to model, um, we wanted to figure out what MKS6 was doing, but we wanted to sidestep that pesky embryonic lethality. And so how we designed it is we had a flox allele of M MKS6 and we can knock it out after induction. We know that this protein gets degraded. This small bit of protein gets degraded right away. And so it's, it's, um, it's, it's deemed a knockout and we can, we can take these animals that have the flox allele and inject through tamoxifen um, to induce the knockout um, at P7. And so that's, we can wait two more weeks and, and, and euthanize at P21 to look at er, early, um, de, early um, generation of the retina of photoreceptor cells this way, or we can, let's see, or we can um, inject in adults. And so we can see the contribution of MKS6 in fully mature uh, retina by simply injecting at P56 once a day for five days. Okay, and then you euthanize at five months old. So we've got an early um, knockout and an, and an older knockout. Okay, so we can look at the differences in those two models. So here are those fun spidergrams again. So Katie, was back at doing um, counting nuclei in the outer nuclear layer. This is now a three week, three week old juvenile induced um, knockout of MKS6. And we can see the error bars are there. They're just under these big symbols. Um, we, we see a statistically significant decrease in, in uh, the retinal thickness in the, in the juvenile animals and a marked decrease in the degeneration in the adult induced. So this tells us that MKS6 is critical for the overall homeostasis of these cells. Because when, when the retina is fully formed and happy, right, healthy cells, then you induce the MKS6 knockout in fully formed retina, it still undergoes a degeneration. Okay, so it is, it is a, a contributing factor to, to the overall health of the photoreceptors. We can, we can stain with tunnel to look for apoptotic cells. And, and, um, we can see that in the MKS6 knockouts, we have marked tunnel staining. So um, that's, oh shoot, my graphs. So this is, this is wild type and this is the M MKS6 nulls. And we can see that there's a lot more uh, apoptotic nuclei in the MKS6 animals. Sorry about that. But what about the protein localization? Oh. oh, goodness me. <laughs> Um, so we have, sorry about that, I keep, I, um, trend, I have track electronic stuff sometimes. Transducin properly traffics in the MKS6 knockouts. So we see uh, transducin localization and um, to the outer segments in the, in the flox alleled animals, same as wild type, um, same here in the, the um, MKS6 nulls, we see, we see um, transducin in the light down here where it should be as the same in the MKS6, okay? Rhodopsin looks to be mislocalized in MKS6 nulls. Instead of being in the outer segments like you're seeing here in green, we see rhodopsin mislocalized to the inner segments and into the outer nuclear layer in the juvenile in induced animals. 
in light, we see we see rhodopsin is still mislocalized. There's no massive movement of rhodopsin, not surprisingly. Look at arrestin. So arrestin here is, should be in the inner segment. It in dark adapted animals, it is in MKS6 nulls. But look what happens in the light. We see massive arrestin mislocalization. So it's it's all over the place. Any place in the cytoplasm, arrestin is there. And, and same thing with conarestin. It seems to be um, localized the way it should be in uh, just arrestin for looking at in cone arrestins. So we don't see a marked change in the localization. We don't see those, those brightly green punct punctate staining of arrestin down at, this, at the cone synapses. And so this is looking more and more like it's, it's a rod phenotype instead of a cone phenotype, which frankly I find remarkably interesting. So rods and cones are very, very similar, but they do have some subtle differences. And I think we're uncovering some of the, the subtleties between rods and cones. What about, what about the functionality of them? So, we, so Katie ran ERGs on these animals. These are um, one week post-induction, okay? So in the adult induced. So these are the adult animals that we've induced to knock out MKS6, and now we're tracking it over time, we're tracking the, the, the ERG signatures over time. In wild type here, or actually this is the flox allele, but it's the same as wild type, we see a, a, a green deflection of the corneal voltage, that's the A wave due to rods, and a, a corneal positive um, B wave. Um, same with the MKS6, right? So this is the, 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 the knockout, adult-induced knockout. We see a, an A wave and a B wave. Almost looks like it's, it's um, well, the kinetics are about the same between the two. Um, at both light levels, right? At low light level and, and a brighter light uh, scotopic ERGs. Here's five weeks. It's coming, there it is. Um, here's the five week post injection, right? So we have an, um, in purple, we have a nice uh, A wave, but it's not as deep that the, the amplitude of the A wave is not as, is not as big as it is in wild types. Same thing. Well, looking here at the 12 week post induction, it's really the, the rod photoreceptors are dead. So it took, um, oh, it took a, a few weeks for, for the rods to be completely dead um, in these adult induced animals. Okay, what about the photopic response? Photopic response, um, it too was attenuated, although early on, you, you don't really see a, a marked difference in the A and the B wave. It's slightly, um, the amplitude is actually a little bit stronger in the knockouts and that was statistically significant, but it does start to diminish. And at this point, the retina is, is, is pretty much um, um, dying at this point. So hopefully I have told you, you have convinced you that um, in our MKS6 mouse model, in the juvenile induced, we see a significant increase of cell death at three weeks. Um, adult induced, we see a significant decrease in the outer nuclear layer at five months. Um, in the juvenile induced MKS6 nulls, we see a mislocalization of rhodopsin in the dark in dark and light, and mislocalization of arrestin in light at, at, at adapted animals. The ERGs in the adult-induced animals exhibit a progressive loss of retinal function, and all the function, all the retinal uh, function was diminished by 12 weeks post-induction in the adult animal models. So between these two projects, um, we found that the connecting cilium component roles are different between rods and cones. And to me, that is that is quite striking. Um, both complexes involved arrestin, arrestin one tra uh, trafficking issues. So regardless if it was a, a, um, a bibiosome component or the transition zone component, arrestin trafficking um, was affected in both photoreceptors. Um, there could be potential interactions between the complexes that lead to the different differences in disease severity. So remember there are a lot of proteins in those areas and, and we all have subtle mutations along the way. And one thing that could be happening is that we're seeing that, that BBS5 may be affected by other mutations and that could cause the um, changes in phenotypes that we see not only within 
populations, but within families. Um, we're interested in the arrested mislocalization. We don't know if it's getting to where it needs to go and is leaking back, or if it's if it's never not quite getting up there. And so, like I had mentioned before, um, one of our one of our projects that we're doing now, or, or we're we're tagging with with photo switchable constructs, um, Dendra two and 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 photo activatables to be able to see. Um, older populations of arrestin versus newer populations of arrestin um, to be able to see if these proteins are actually leaking back down or not getting to the outer segments. And so that's still projects that are ongoing in the lab. Um, so the, my next slide is to thank everybody. This is Katie Bales. She was the rock star that did the vast majority of the work. Here's Brad Yoder right there. In one of our, um, we, we, we do fun outings when it's not COVID time. So this was one of our paintball sessions. Um, but Katie's now um, now doing a postdoc. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I would love to take any questions if anybody has any. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, um, Alicia. And I don't know, I can at least start with the questions. I don't know if, if people want to do chat or how we work with that. But um, a, a couple questions, just as you map out you know your projects and what you're doing how do you choose you know when you've got nine whatever nine plus bbs proteins why do you choose bbs5 what you know what what attracted you to that protein or was that or did you try many different proteins to try to figure out your project uh we're trying all of them to be the answer is is anything that that is anything that we can uncover we 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 try to knock it out um okay and and that's mainly um Brad's arena, right? He's he's the the mouse generator, um, and um, he is critically interested in what's happening with polycystic kidneys. And and I will always argue with Brad, and I do constantly, that the retina is the best place to look for ciliopathies, simply because the um, almost all of these um, ciliopathy of patients that have a ciliopathy have retinal disease. And so it's it's better to be looking in the retina than it is to be looking in other other organ types. But there are some, there are a bunch of a, a bunch of people in um in that are doing research on these different different proteins. And so we're basically taking the animals that haven't that haven't had knockouts yet and making those and trying to map them better. This is a a, a pretty um Act a, a pretty. Uh, this this cartoon was based on on data from the literature. So these we know that, for example, MKS six interacts with MKS one three five and PHP five and CEP two ninety. Um, BBS five interacts with BBS two mainly, hardly um, with BBS seven, but not with BBS six. They all have slightly different roles, um, but we 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 have a series of of animals. Um, and let's see. MPHP4, we've got running around in the lab, MPHP1. Um, so that it's kind of a hand-waving answer to it, other than we're, we're trying to go for broke and uncover really the, the molecular composition of the transition zone. It's a really small area, and it, all these proteins are so stuck together that it's, it's pretty difficult. It'd be fun to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And with patients with BBS5, how, you know, do, do their ERGs correlate with your mice? What correlations or differences do you see? So they do. Um, we, we are fortunate, um, and I don't have these data because they're, they're currently um, getting taken. We have a BBS5 family here. Um, and so, and it's, we're, we're actually quite lucky because this um, gentleman that, that um, the, the father has, um, is, has five children, which is really not typical with, with um, Barty beetle patients. They have hypergonadism and, and have difficult, difficulty reproducing, but this gentleman does not. He has, he has more kids than I, I have. Um, and so we're, we're doing ERGs on them, but the, the ERGs are, are, are very similar to in the same phenotype as our animals. Okay. All right, good. I are there other questions? I can't see if people are trying yeah. to ask questions um, or not. Alicia, yeah. um, like everything else you do, absolutely gorgeous work. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you? So, so one of the things that always amazes me is is how much protein trafficking actually happens in the psyllium just normally, right? Um, do you have any idea 
on on the kinetics of, of translocation of, of arrestin in these knockouts uh, in light adaptation? Does it, um, I mean, I mean, you show beautifully how they mislocalize and how they you know, repartition and, and, but, but do you have any information on the kinetics? I don't. Um, I think Vadim Arshavsky does. Yeah. Um, from his work previously, and I don't have the I don't have the kinetics off the top of my head. Okay. Um, it is quite fast, um, and these have to be bright, bright, bright lights, and complete darkness to be able to see that massive translocation. It's not regular room light. We mm -hmm. we stick a um, an LED lamp right over their cage and, and take out all of their things that they can hide. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that we can get full um, this localization. I don't know the kinetics of it off the top of my head. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Are these, uh, are the, so, so I presume these are all pigmented animals? I'm sorry? I presume these are all pigmented animals? These are. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Gorgeous. Um, I, I've got lots of questions about the synapses too. Um, so, are, are are you um, are you in your serial block based scanning? Am are you doing the photoreceptor outer segments, or are you doing the whole photoreceptor with the with the synaptic terminal as well? So, on these animals, just the outer segments. Okay. On the next project that I'll talk to you about, we're doing the entire the entire beast. So, ah. um, the next the next. Um, seminar I'm gonna be talking about is about this protein called NUD-C, nuclear distribution protein C. And it, um, it regulates F-actin pools. It also regulates, or actin equilibrium. And it also regulates dynein mediated movements so movement across microtubule train tracks. And, and um, you know, I'm interested if th there, there's microtubules down at the synapse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if that gets di um, disrupted. So, in that project with Tom Burgoyne, we're doing the whole photoreceptor cell. Um, it is expensive and it's it takes a lot of time and you know um, to be able to do those. So we're just going to focus on the transition zone uh, mutants. We're just going to focus on the outer segments and that and that connecting psyllium area. Cool. Um, we, we've got some time tomorrow. Uh, one on one, we'll, we'll, we'll chat about this. I'd love to. Thank you. Okay. So Paul, this is uh, this is Randy. Listen, uh, that was a beautiful lecture, and uh, look forward to getting a chance to chat a, a little further. But uh, I, you know, love the basic science and being able to dig in into detail about all of these syndromes that I learned about, you know, in my in my younger years, and now understanding how the chemistry fits together. Anyway, congratulations! Uh, it Thank was you. great to listen to this great work. Thank you. And I have a question through the chat from Jeff Petty, which unless he wants to speak up, I'll just read it. Um, Jeff Petty says, really beautiful science. You mentioned the 3D TM reconstructions. What do you anticipate learning from additional understanding of the overall morphology? So I am absolutely fascinated by disks, right? I, I don't understand the delta g of making a disc a disc and not a, a sphere is like super high it's it's i can't believe that we can see i can't believe that outer segments look the way they do they are gorgeous but they are so precise and i you know my lab and a bunch of other labs are, are really really interested in how discs are formed and if we can see how the if if, if we can reconstruct how the discs look you know those bbs5 have goofy outer segments, you know, they they do have nice spacing between the discs, but some of them are this way and I don't know why. And I'm gonna show you some more screwed up discs in the next talk with the NUDC knockouts. The F actin is is all is critical in disc formation. Um, so I, I really hope that we can gain a better understanding of how these discs are formed in general. Um, serial block face scanning does give you a, a, a really cool opportunity to th 3D reconstruct that, that region. And so we can see disks um, unlike a way we've ever seen before. Okay. You know, they are fixed. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not like doing tomography where you could flash freeze and then see a small portion, but we still will be able to glean a lot of information from it. Okay. All right, very good. Any other questions from anyone? If not, we will 
finish up and we will see you at noon again for more more basic science so i hope many of you can can join us then and we um since this is a virtual visiting lectureship you get to talk with a lot of us through the day through today and tomorrow yeah, i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to it and thank you all for your attention i really appreciate you taking the time this morning okay